welcome to our blog. And today I'm here with uh, good old Professor Ben Burgess. And we're talking about the late, great Professor uh, G.A. Cohen. Um, Cohen's interesting. Uh, and I'll, you know, I'll get into to this. I know that I'm actually a little bit more of a gestalt interest in analytical Marxism, as in I've studied more than Cohen. Um, but Cohen's interesting, unlike, say, Romer or Elster, uh, or Sparowski, Sparowski, uh, of that first generation of analytics, and that he wasn't as dependent on neoclassical economics as the others were. So he was not like taking in things to fix Marxism that were problematic from another discipline, such as the assumption of equilibrium or uh, pure methodological individualism. Now, I actually am sympathetic to methodological individualism, but when you're talking about aggregates, it's kind of irrelevant. Oh. Um, but I wanted to ask you, because... Uh, I actually started from an analytical Marxist kind of orientation and got less so over time. Yeah. And I think your journey may be the opposite. So how did you get into Cohen? Yeah, uh, I should say, I mean, I've read a little bit of, I've read a little bit of Rober. I've, I've read a little bit of Eric Olin Wright. Uh, so uh, I read a lot of Eric Olin Wright, but yeah. So, you know, but definitely as, in terms of my level of interest in these guys, I mean, Cohen's right up at the top and then like, you know, uh, I guess Wright gets the, gets the silver medal and, uh, and, uh, Rober, uh, who I, you know, I feel kind of bad about putting it quite like this. Like, I think that what I've read, like, it's not like he doesn't say anything that I find interesting, uh, or, or insightful, but it's like Rober's the, definitely the one who, who I, uh, I vibe least, you know, with, with most of what he says, um, and kind of for reasons related to what you just said. Right. So, um, I, I think that, um, Romer at his worst seems to me to be somebody who sort of, um, takes, uh, kind of vaguely Marx flavored concerns and like comes up with ways to use these, these tools of neoclassical economics to, to sort of, um, make sense of some version of those concerns, uh, but in a way that I think if you're interested in Marxism is often going to leave you a little cold. Cause like, it's, it's like, you know, what Rober, uh, like what Rober means by exploitation just has very little to do, you know, with, with what, um, you know, Marx meant by exploitation or, you know, that like whatever. So. Um, yeah. Romer seems to be neoclassical economics plus Max Weber. Like that's and not even that much Max Weber. That's a little too. Marxist for him. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Uh it's like um uh, it's just not, you know, there's just not much like so one thing I like about Cohen is the combination of the analytic rigor with the fact that he is actually really deeply engaged, most obviously in Karl Marx's theory of history, but also uh, also other places with you know Marx, like you know, with with like the actually like thinking hard about what Marx means by various things, even if he, you know goes on to you know sort of accept or reject some of it a la carte you know it's 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 coming from that that place uh but yeah so so you asked about kind of coming to be interested in it and and i'm definitely in the sort of long view i am definitely the other trajectory because you know I, I started out as an extremely um unanalytic uh marxist uh you know i mean i, I started out as as a uh you know I started out as like a, a dirty trot, a dogmatic true belief in trot, you know? So, uh, so like, I, I think I, uh, you know, I don't know. I think like at some point down the line, I, 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 you know, I, I read somebody say that, you know, you, you have to, uh, you know, read Hegel's science of logic to understand the first chapter of capital and that, you know, Lenin was reading that, you know, just, you know, I don't know, on the train or just before he went back to Russia. And so I was like, Oh, well, this is the magic holy book. You know, like I gotta, I gotta, you know, do my best to, uh, to, to read and understand this. And, you know, and, and I just kind of took it for granted that it's like, you know, what, like, I don't know, they're like a few pages in 
the uh, ante during where where Engels gives these like laws of dialectics. As like, oh, okay, well, there you go. You know, there's the holy writ. You know, you just you just gotta internalize that. You know, figure you know figure out what it you know what it means to apply it. Um, and uh, and you know, I I remember certainly reading uh the Leon Trotsky's uh uh the uh you know like that um in defense of Marxism you know his his book of of like the sort of battling you know, these like essays where he's denouncing um. Uh, this distant faction of the Socialist Workers Party, and like a little bit of what they're arguing about, oddly enough, sort of overlaps or at least rhymes with this, because uh, it's because um, you know one of the leaders of that faction, James Berta, was was sort of um, you know was a philosophy professor who who I, I, I suppose the term would be a little anachronistic to use in 1939, but you know was was something like an analytic philosopher, and so it it it, uh, it comes up. You know, in uh, it comes up in that that book, and like I was like, oh, you know, this all must be right, right? Yeah. Although the James Burnham defections actually, you know, ends up being kind of a big deal because Burnham is Burnham is a key figure for the paleoconservative right, for the neoconservative right. He's a key player in the OSS, and he may have been a fascist sympathizer? Question mark. <laughs> um because he sure as hell sounds like one in the new machiavellians like um yeah i mean not not during world war ii right because that was no the, no uh, you know because because like you know when he so burnham's uh his well whatever it's not original to him but you know his version of theory of, you know bureaucratic collectivism which is sort of a weird ancestor to i think the least helpful versions of pmc theory now uh is a um is uh all about how uh you know the soviet union nazi germany and also the stuff he liked the least about the united states you know was was like converging on being the same thing but um but but yeah i mean i wouldn't be surprised i mean certainly he was a diehard you know crazy reactionary anti-communist you know later in uh uh later in life um, well his justifications for all of his like when he gives up yeah. on bureaucratic collectivism and he he still kind of believes it in managerial yeah. uh the, the managerial elite theory um he finds evidence for it from all these defectors to fascism from the yeah. from the s pay day and like uh not so much pareto who's just always a reactionary but like in sombart in uh in uh, Robert Michel, et cetera. Um, now, I, I find analytical Marxism very interesting because it doesn't do that. Like, like one of the things that Trotskyists would always, would always trot out when you talked about, like, not just analytical Marxism, like analytical philosophy at all, even like yeah. when analytics would like try to engage with Hegel, they would break out like Lukács's... Uh, um, history and class consciousness and break out the reification essay and then like finger rag at you and basically tell you that analytic philosophy was all a counter-revolutionary reactionary mess. Um, and I just remember going like, well, then you don't understand dialectics either <laughs> because it's not that different. It's a different, I mean, there is, the, by the time you get to Hegel, there's a, there's a more substantive different, but it's a different, mode of doing philosophy one that where you, you know classically you just don't define your terms at first and uh, you set out and debate right uh, um by hegel it turns into something else but well so I was, I was gonna say i mean like this is where what i've been describing is is where i started right and for mm -hmm. you know i mean look for better or for worse like uh i <laughs> you know i think that they're like there's probably like tons of shit that i believe circa 2023 that's just stuff that like i started thinking that and i never you know i never got over that part you know but um but i did you know i did do the thing that members of trotsky's sex do where they they burn out and uh and and they sort of stop being politically active and you know start thinking about other things or whatever so i did that you know i kind of um this is all as like a you know teenager and i have a uh and then um you know, I, I got, you know, very politically active again, like around the beginning of the, uh, you know, war on terror and especially with the Iraq war. And then, you know, and then, you know, after that kind of fizzled out, 
was once again not very right i still thought all the stuff that i you know more or less thought uh for the most part but like i didn't you know i was doing other stuff with my life and the reason all this is relevant to your question is that the other stuff i was doing with my life was by then going to graduate school to study you know analytic philosophy and uh and in in my case you know the what i was focused on at that point really had very you know nothing to do with with political philosophy like even even somewhat consciously you know wanted to just kind of you know think about other stuff uh but um but you know did so spend all those years very immersed in sort of that tradition of of you know reasoning and doing philosophy and all that stuff and then um and then when i kind of got to a point where i wanted to to think more again about marxist theory obviously there was a lot of appeal to me to uh to to people who were thinking about marxist theory sort of in an analytic philosopher sort of way all of which you know i mean maybe i i just am too much of one not to be able to do this part i should say is like I, as I say it, like, I feel weird about it. Cause like, it's such a vague term. Like, it's like, what, what does that actually mean exactly? Right. You know, that, uh, but you know, it's like, it's, it's one of those like, well, okay, what is analytic philosophy as opposed to continental philosophy? Good luck, you know, good luck giving me necessary and sufficient conditions, but you certainly, you know, but you sure know it when you see it. Yeah. Yeah. You do. I mean, occasionally there are people like say Brandom or Wilfred uh -oh. Sellers or somebody who can go back and forth between the two or Richard Rorty, but, uh, generally yeah there's a pretty hard split i.e um analytics define their terms and continentals sometimes do um <laughs> yeah we'll see that's what that's what i'm saying like it's hard to it's hard to come up with a condition like that and be like okay this is the this is the thing right you know that because um like defining your terms i mean yeah um like that's something I mean, certainly like classical, you know, analytic philosophy, there's a lot of attention devoted to like conceptual analysis. So it's like you know, defining your terms, like the whole thing. But then there are all these analytic philosophers now who think that's kind of a, you know, failed project. And you just shouldn't, shouldn't bother with that. And, you know, there, there are continental philosophers who will make a big deal of like, you know, hey, I'm going to try out my term and I'm going to tell you exactly what, it, you know, so it's like, yeah, it's very, very difficult to come up with hard and fast lines. And especially now, I think, um, you know, because as you kind of alluded to earlier, I mean, look, there are, um, you certainly can't do it in terms of substantive theses because there's, you know, you can find some philosophers who believe whatever you want to, you know, who, um, you know, who argue for it, you know, in any of these modes. Uh, you can maybe do, and even in terms of like chains of influence, which is probably like the, you know, I mean, really what we're talking about, I think more than anything is sort of some kind of hard to pin down, but unmistakable kind of stylistic issue, sort of, and like, and, and kind of style of argument and then yeah. ch chains of influence. But even with the chains of influence, like you were kind of alluded to, it's like, yeah, whatever you could find, you know, 2023 is weird, right? They're, they're analytic Hegelians. They're, you know, analytic philosophers of mind who are really into Heidegger. You know, it's like, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's got it very messy, but clearly we still have some idea of what we're talking about. And like part of what makes Cohen interesting is that he's doing that thing, you know, for Marxism. Yeah. I think the interesting thing about the key Cohen text, I mean, there's three that I really refer to a lot. Um, there's, uh, if you're an egalitarian, why are you so rich? Which he wrote right before he died. I, I believe I graduated university when that was written. Um, uh, why not socialism? And then Karl Marx's theory of history of defense, which I think is the book that's the most. I'm not going to say the most substantive, but it's the one that deals with things. From a not just like normative. Mm -hmm place because i think i think why not socialism and uh if you're an egalitarian why are you so rich are are kind of moral text actually as much as they are sociological or philosophical that's yeah. not the case for the Karl marx uh theory history book yeah i mean why not socialism is is purely i mean it's just doing moral philosophy it's it's uh uh you know it's like here's you know here's why this is a desire desirable ideal and you know 
it should inform your politics because it's you know desirable ideal and then like here's my response to a bunch of objections to that like that's the that's all that book is which you know when i say that's all it is i actually think in a lot of ways it's a brilliant book but i mean it's a uh, but i mean like that's very explicitly the project uh if you're an egalitarian why why are you so rich is kind of a weird combination of things because it's um uh, i mean maybe i'm jumping the gun here but like my thing about that book so it's his, his gifford lectures from i'm not sure exactly when sometime in the 2000s um and in um and like if he'd like ended it a few a few lectures early earlier it would be like one of like my all-time favorite books but like you know there is actually a ton of stuff i disagree with in the last few lectures but like yeah it's it's like a, a big part of that book is moral philosophy and then part of it is like autobiography and then there is actually some interesting Marx and Jesus in it, but um, you know, but it's all over the place. And there's two lesser known books that I've actually only kind of perused in a library once. Um, I've never actually read. And that is the, I believe self-ownership, the self-ownership freedom and equality one. Mm -hmm. And then there is one that's even more obscure history, labor and freedom. Yeah. which I believe from the 80s is pre and I would tell people if they get uh, a version of the defense book, which if you're going to start with Jayco and I do think that's yeah. the one you should start with um, get the one that deals with stuff after the fall of the Soviet Union. So get the second edition, not the first. Mm -hmm. It actually matters in that book. Usually there's not that big a difference. But there's a kind of big difference in his revisions to that text. Yeah, so so you might actually have an have an advantage on me now because I I've you know I know the uh, second edition of that book pretty well. I've even taught a class about it, but the um, but I don't really. I mean, like other than the fact that like you know there are some new chapters that are clearly labeled as such. Um, I don't I don't really know that much about you know what the uh, the sort of original versions of the original chapters look like in the ways that they're different for the revised. Yeah, so there's just there's no predictions about the Soviet Union in the original one, and it kind of avoids actually coming down one way or the other on a lot of the debates. Um, and there's also a little bit more caginess about how radically they're departing from traditional marks in the first edition, where you know the second edition has starts off with the essay with the no bullshit Marxism essay, which is uh, if you're a Hegelian Marxist, it's a declaration of war. Right. But, um, <laughs> you know, yeah. it, I think it's interesting. Um, I find Cohen and Perowski, or Perowski, I'm never quite sure if you pronounce P or not in that, um, interesting in that they use a lot of game theory and, and whatnot and how they set this up. But would you like to, like... Sure. How do you understand the argument of uh, Karl Marx's theory of history of defense? Like, what is going yeah. on there? Uh, yeah, so I guess one interesting thing, so something a while ago that um, Fred Kale Brooks said is that it would really, you know, it is that, you know, I, I think is like worth keeping in mind is it's like, you know, when it says Karl Marx's theory of history, like that means something really specific, right? Like it would actually be a, an interesting book, but a very different book to be like, you know, Karl Marx's views on history or something. And like, you know, just kind of go through and analyze, you know, all of the, the you know, all of the historical, um, you know, sort of claims and theory about history scattered around, you know, Marx's his books. But like what this really means is like, Marx's theory really more than anything of uh, historical change uh, at and like with particular reference and this is not unique to Cohen like other people who do um, you know who do scholarship on this sort of question right historical materialism Marx's theory of history will do the same thing like it really takes as the sort of uh, key uh, launchpad text uh, Marx's 1859 preface uh, which uh, which has um, the you know which which like there are a few like extremely famous paragraphs from that that you know if you've you know seen a you know if you've like read a fair bit of, of about Marx you've you've definitely seen people quote this you know that the uh, this uh, it's where the the term superstructure 
come like the base superstructure that's that's where that's where that comes from it's it's where um it's where marx uh talks about you know social being you know determining uh, determining consciousness um it's like he sort of it's like just a very concentrated like form of here are his big claims about how um you know modes of production you know rise and fall over the course of history and what happens kind of along with that or as a result of that um and so uh this is um now i should say maybe i've just been too brainwashed by this book uh but i i don't you know, I don't think this is kind of like a, you know, 1859 fancy. I think like the sort of basic claims he makes in those paragraphs, you could see all over the place in other marks. I mean, there's a, you could, you know, there are parts of the communist manifesto where he says a lot of that, you know, there's, there's a, uh, you know, there's this certainly stuff in capital, you know, where he, where he says a lot of that, you know, but, um, but I, I, you know, and part of the reason I'm saying that is that like what Cohen is defending and it's an interesting, you know, we can get to how much of his defense like is convincing or holds up or, you know, what should be defended and if it should be, whether you should do it in Cohen's way. But like what he's defending, I think a lot of latter day Marxists would sort of say, ah, well, that's like some kind of, you know, second international mechanistic kind of, you know, understanding of, of Marxism. It's like, yeah, maybe, but like, I also think it's, you know, I also think like the sort of core claims he's talking about, it's like Marx's understanding of, of Marxism, not all of it, Right. Not all Marx is understanding of Marxism, but I mean, I think they're like crucial. They're things that are really important to Marx also. Uh, so not the not the uh, not the Hegelian stuff that's important to Marx, but, the you know, but like the sort of claims about um, social and political and economic history that are really important to uh, to to Marx. Um, so so basically the picture is that the um, that. Um, you know, the legal and political superstructure, interested side note, uh, Marx never talks about an ideological superstructure. Everybody thinks he does, but he never says that. There are things no, that's says. purely out to fair. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are things Marx says you could sort of, you know, read as suggested that or whatever, but he certainly never combines words that way. Uh, he has, so, um, so when Marx says superstructure, what he means are legal and political institutions. He's very explicit about that. And uh, so, you know, the basic picture is that these legal and political institutions are in some way downstream from the relations of production, like do your, does your society, which, um, you know, certainly as Cohen explicates it and, you know, is, is uh, about the, the class structure, you know, does your society have lords and serfs, does it have capitalists and workers, you know, what's the, uh, you know, like what, what, are the, what are the sort of dominant uh, production relation? Uh, between the immediate producers who are actually making stuff and the uh, and and the ruling class of that society, and the relations of production, in turn, and this is one of the most controversial things about what Cohen is defending. Although I think, again, I I would argue it is pretty unambiguously there in Marx, is that the relation these relations of production are themselves downstream from the development level of development of the forces of production. That um, so you know, roughly the capacity of, of a society to, uh, to, to produce stuff. Um, and then what's, so a lot of the book, I mean, one way that that's helpful, I think, to set this up is that there are, um, you know, like a Marxist theory of history is really a theory of two things, right? A theory of the stages of history. In other words, what is capitalism like? What is feudalism like? Right. Most importantly, what is capitalism like? That's obviously what Marx spends, you know, most of his time on. Uh, so so that's a theory of the stages of history. But then there's also a theory of of historical change. Uh, how is it that you go from one to the other and why does it happen when it happens and all of that? And so quite a bit of um, quite a bit of Karl Marx's theory of history is devoted to the what the stages of history are like. In other words, like an analysis of, of like what we mean when we, you know, um, how different like class relationships are differentiated from each other. Uh, what's, uh, you know, is it precisely true to say that, you know, that workers have, um, uh, you know, that like part of what makes you a proletarian is that, you know, you don't own any means of production or is there a sort of, or, you know, or should we, you know, be to be more precise, should we say something that's sort of in the neighborhood of that, which is where Cohen ends up landing that, you know, being, that uh, to be, you know, one of the conditions for being a proletarian is that you can't support yourself through your ownership. 
of uh, of means of production. So a lot of the book is stuff like that. That stuff for my money, I'd be interested to hear where you come down. But that stuff for me, I think that all holds up really well. I think that the um, the most controversial part and the part where I'm kind of only half with him is about um, the theory of transitions. So um, in other words, the classical Marx's claim that he's interested in defending in that book is that there's some important sense in which relations of production uh, that like revolutions happen when a mode of production, right? The social mode of production, the set of relations of production uh, fetter the further development of the forces of production. And, um, and so, you know, like the most obvious example, you know, would be, um, you know, maybe you can, uh, would be feudalism to capitalism that the, uh, that, you know, feudal relation, you know, feudal class relations were, uh, were a, a hindrance to the further development of the forces of production in some fairly obvious ways. Uh, that's true enough. The question of whether that's, um, that's kind of the main explanation of why it is that the bourgeois revolutions happened when they happened. Why is it that there was this, you know, process of, you know, feudalism going away and being replaced in incremental and revolutionary ways in different countries, you know, by, by capitalism is much more controversial among historians. Uh, you know, there's, there's this, there's this whole giant sprawling, uh, debate that happens, you know, uh, uh you know, kind of, uh, you know, it's the Breder debate, you know, that's, that's like to a great extent about that exact point, right? It's like, is this what happened? Is there something sort of more local and contingent that really explains how it is that capitalism starts the way, it, you know, when it does, um, or, or is the, is the federal thing really, really it? So that's one question. And then another question, which is huge for that book, uh, is, okay, let's say it was what happened, feudalism to capitalism or, you know, whatever, previous uh, previous changes in most production is that really plausible hey, how we should think about the transition from capitalism to socialism because man i'm not a uh, I'm not a degrowther or anything but like uh you know capitalism is the most um hyper efficient developer of the forces of production that's that's ever existed and it's uh and you know i know people who do believe very firmly that socialism would be would be like more productively efficient than capitalism i'm not sure i believe that i'm i'm not sure i'd even want something to be <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah like yeah i mean could <laughs> could that could could the world sustain that yeah it, it's we might talk about it might be pro more productive in, in very specific ways you might have like rationalized labor uh you know, for example, there's a whole lot of labor that we have that is irrational right now because it is just done to increase surplus profit. But, mm -hmm. uh, well, irrational. I always have to, like, I, I re I'm remembering I'm talking to an analytic philosopher and I'm going to have to turn on my analytic philosopher brain. This is one of the things that, that Ben and I actually share. We're kind of trained in both continental and analytic philosophy. <laughs> Uh, and I, and I kind of ha I have admittedly compartmentalized the Hegel brain and the not yeah, Hegel yeah. brain. Um, <laughs> totally, yeah. Uh, but when we say rationally, you have to really be like rational by what grounds and rational yeah. towards what, right? Yeah. Um, but efficiency is kind of an objective question, and capitalism, uh, until relatively recently, um. Uh, was super efficient at, at like getting stuff like productivity up. The productivity declines that we've seen in the last decade are, are kind of very much post 2008, 2009 issues. And, and I would love for Cohen to still be alive and writing to talk about what he thinks is happening because a lot of us are now like, well, it looks like neoliberalism's doing something else. Um, trying I, to morph, but who I knows? Also say, like, one of my uh, kind of I don't know minor criticisms, Cohen, or I don't know if it's a criticism exactly. It's just sort of a note, right? About about something he got wrong is is that um, you know uh, you could argue about how deeply this this mistake is tied into anything he thought theoretically, but like he uh, there are definitely places scattered around uh, Cohen where he he makes some comments that are like just way too optimistic about um, 
the uh, the, the post war settlement lasted forever. Like, I mean, obviously, he'd eventually live to see neoliberalism, you know, be very, very triumphant. But, you know, he definitely didn't see it coming. It's weird going back and reading even the, the Altusarians, the yeah. Hegelians, yeah. and the analyticals in the 60s and 70s, because they all basically assume that the Fordist social compact will somehow last forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they are all wrong. <laughs> like... um. Yeah. <laughs> and that actually is why I do take some of the Hegelians a little bit more seriously because some of them are better on that. Uh, but I think it's crucial that point you talk about the transition. I mean, the other super controversial point about um, Cohen was not controversial during his life and it's controversial now. And that is like why totally reject labor theory of value. Um, there are a lot of people in like the econo physics school who try to who oh. redefine it. Um, by that, because yeah, we, should, we should definitely talk about the labor theory of value. Uh, that like, and I think it's interesting too, because like one of the first things you said is that Cohen is different from from John Romer or uh, you know, I don't know, Elster. You, you mentioned a couple other people saying, uh, in the sense that uh, he's not really that preoccupied with uh you know neoclassical economics which which is really not right i mean he, he sort of makes uh he like makes a comment or two here and there that suggests that he does actually accept a lot of that stuff but it's not really a premise in in yeah. any of his big arguments as far as i can tell right? yeah, there's like, nothing dependent on like market equilibrium theory which there is in other analytical marxists which is a big problem yeah i mean i don't think um like I don't know. There's like a comment in uh, in Why Not Socialism about you know uh, you know bourgeois economics being you know unfortunately correct about a lot or something. And uh, and he, although I think in context, it seems like the work that comment is really doing is more like sort of take calculation problems seriously and less like um, you know here's any specific thesis I'm really endorsing. You know, but. Um, even in the stuff of the labor theory of value, like I will say, I actually really misremember this. And um, so before this conversation, I, uh, I sent you this, this essay that I wrote for mm -hmm. uh, uh, Matt McManus and Conrad Hamilton's essay forthcoming, who knows, uh, some point of the future, uh, the uh, flowers for Marx. Uh, and in that essay, I sort of awkwardly, um, like put in a footnote saying some of this because like when I wrote the first draft, I kind of misremembered what he said about this, and then I I went back and I actually in the uh, in my uh, capital class, like I, I I went over this essay in detail with the students, and what I did, I realized that you know some of it didn't say what I thought it did, and because the uh, the part of the essay that I the part of the labor theory of value essay that I'd always focused on was the sort of like. Um, is the labor theory of value integral to the exploitation claim part, which is like the last part. And, you know, I think in my memory, I kind of thought it's like, yeah, he probably is just sort of accepting a lot of what he's, you know, hearing from his, you know, friends like Rober about, you know, sort of neoclassical economic assumptions and that, that and that's, and that's, and that must be why, right. He's, he's worried about it being false. Uh, but then going back and looking at it, I realized it's actually not true. I mean, maybe that's true in some sort of background way. Like maybe that's like, you know, maybe that was like psychologically true of Cohen, right? That that's like kind of what got him thinking about this in the first place. I have no idea, but it's not the argument he makes in the essay. The argument he makes in the essay is this textual argument that um, that uh, Marx is um, that the claims that uh, that Marx makes about the labor theory of value and capital don't you know don't all fit together, or that they uh, that there's uh, uh, that and that actually. Um, uh, you know that like there's this inconsistency and that there's and that and that like once you sort of realize that you know that that it, it's not going to do the work that he wants him to do and like you know it's so you know uh by that or not right it's a it's a it's a marx argument it's it's not a it's it's not a like it's not an argument from anything about academic economics really mm -hmm. um and yeah i don't i don't totally know what i think about like okay so um I know you tend to avoid it in essays. <laughs> like, I, I do tend to avoid it in essays. Yeah, there's, a there's a reason. Uh, 
because uh, I'm just not sure, right? Like it's a, uh, uh, I think uh, really what it is is they have a really what I should do in essays is I should just like, you know, until it's no longer true, I should just put it in a footnote apologizing that I still haven't read Anwar Sheikh yet. And, uh, and, and that I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be a little evasive about this until I do. Uh, <laughs> I actually sat down, you know, um, inspired by, by the analytical Marxist, just to map what everybody has asserted uh, the Marxian labor theory of value is, as opposed to the Smithian and Ricardian labor theory of value. Like what, what specifically is unique about it? Why do people like even people we don't associate with the analytical Marxists yeah. like David Harvey does not accept right. labor theory yep. of value. Uh, Zizek doesn't accept labor theory of value. Yet people of our generation and younger are more likely to accept it. But I'm not sure they mean the same thing by mm -hmm. it as people have meant by it in the past. Totally. Um, and I realized it was actually kind of a harder concept when I was like, hey, hey, what value isn't price? Or at least it's yeah. not price of an individual item. What the hell are we talking about? No, exactly. Right? I mean, it's <laughs> like, like if you even just sort of like try to really carefully read the early chapters of Capital and 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 like track all the claims that are going on there, it's like it's a little bit not obvious. And I think in a certain way, Marx doesn't have to um, spell it out in the same way that he. Well, you know, I mean, if we. I know this is like if my grandmother had wheels thing, but like if somehow he was writing the equivalent of capital today, because um, because he was operating in an intellectual environment where, you know, lots of the people he was criticized also, but, you know, like, like had at least somewhat similar beliefs about value, which is part of what leads to the, uh, the sort of exegetical mess about trying to figure out, okay, what's the part that's distinctive to Marx? What are the parts where he's like, I mean, there's all like a, a sort of general issue about reading capital is is like, OK, what's imminent critique and like what's Marx actually saying what he thinks, because uh, there's a lot of both of those. You know, there's a lot of both of those in the book. Right. You know, yeah. there's a lot of, for yeah. example, most of capital volume one assumes commodity money, um, which is not something we still even have. The capital volume two mentions other kinds of money, the state fiat money, while as acknowledged to exist, is barely at play. But if you read the Grundessa, Marx talks about it like completely differently, actually, than he does in Capital. So there are points where I'm like, ah, I don't know. Like I, I, I go through all the mag the mega research. Um, I always want to call it by its German name and make it mega. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's like a weird thing that happens to when, like, um, I mean, I, I'm sort of you know, this is not a completed project, right? But I'm, I'm still, actually, I'd be interested in, if there was any sort of writing that came out of what you just described, I'd be interested in reading it because because in a less systematic way, I mean, I have been making an effort lately to, to try to figure out like, okay, what do all the people who um, who write about that, like, like, what does everybody mean by this, right? What is, what is uh, you know, what does Andrew Kleiman mean? What does, you know, Heinrich mean, right? You know, what, like, like, and, and I, I realize that I'm often not sure totally, right? And uh, and there, it's often um, it's often hard to uh, it's often a, hard, a little bit hard to pin down. But it's like, yeah, a lot of um, you know people will make a big deal of like, I mean, yes, sure, definitely, value isn't price. That much is clear. But it does seem to be it has like some relationship to price, though it is yeah. not clear. Like. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like, and it seems to be really important to the like analytical role it's played, and you know, in, in, in Marx's arguments that it have some kind of relationship to price, right? Like, if you just say, "Oh, the determination of price has absolutely nothing to do with value," then it it it's not clear that it would do like value talk would do most of the work it does in Capital, which, by the way, is also worth remembering. That's like as the book goes on, there's actually less of less value talk. Also, right. I mean, that that's that's just like um, it's like there's obviously the most value talk at the beginning, and and you know, and then like you know, certainly when you get to later chapters where he's doing the the charts with the, you know, this is this is how much of the day that you're working for yourself, and this is how much you know, how, this is all this this is the surplus labor and whatever. There's some value talk mixed in there, you know, but um, really by the time you get into the the second half of the book, there's there's sort of uh, there's sort of remarkably little you know which is also you know 
so so okay so this is so this is maybe a good way to to kind of get back to cohen because cohen uh what he's doing in that labor theory of value essay is um two things right he's criticizing um you know what he takes to be marx's you know value claims in the early chapters of capital and then he's saying okay um even if marx is is wrong about some of that uh then how much does how much damage is inflicted by this the loss of this premise to sort of marx's most important arguments right that's ultimately the project he has his eye on and uh the conclusion is you know at least for exploitation not much uh he sort of concedes the point on the falling rate of profit although um I'm not actually a hundred percent sure about that one. One way or the other, I'd, I'd actually like to. Yeah, the evidence actually measures up quite differently now than it did when Cohen was writing, which is another yeah. uh, another thing that I, I I have pushed back on people on because I'm like, well, we do have falling rates of GDP, and I realize profit and GDP are not exactly aligned. Um, uh. Our falling rates of GDP growth. Um, but they are proximal to one another. And so it, it it's a complicated argument. Um, I, the one thing I will say, and I know I'm going to make the purest Marxist mad at me for this, uh, the argument that Marx actually gives for it in volume two about machines is not actually terribly convincing, even if he's correct about the, the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. Um yeah i mean he also like yeah i mean although i guess i should say just to sort of you know maybe reintroduce some hegelese to the discussion i mean it's like there's also it's like okay there's the argument about the tendency of the rate of profit to fall which is immediately followed by the argument for the counter tendencies so right like, what, what exactly all of that put together empirically predicts is like maybe not totally obvious yeah i mean it if you look at someone like uh, a Henrik Grossman, um, yeah. who like really is not an analytical Marxist, he's a Frankfurt School guy, but unlike the other Frankfurt School guy, actually dealt with numbers and math. I mean, uh, Frederick, uh, Friedrich Pollock also dealt with numbers and math, but in general, Frankfurt schoolers avoid it. Um, the the arguments made there also are kind of opaque because on one sense, there's like a prediction of an imminent super crisis. And then the other, there's enough counter tendencies that are even more spot on and Grossman that you're kind of like, oh, well, capital can just change one of these variables and start the cycle over again. So I don't know what you think you actually got from that. Um, yeah. So, so I mean, there are two, there are two questions here. One is, uh, you know, does the rate of profit have a systemic tendency to fall? Uh, and then the other one is, um, what's the relationship between that claim and value theory? And mm. um, I, I have to say, I mean, it's like it always, uh, uh, you know, it may always pain me to uh, as a uh, as as a professional haver of opinions to uh, to to not have opinions about things. But like, I I think you know the uh the jury in my head is still somewhat out on both of those subjects uh but i i am and as it is on the labor theory of value itself because i think that there's a uh, there's like a sort of there is definitely a labor theory of value that you could derive from some of the comments that marx makes in capital if you take it to be an expression of his own theory and not just you know and mm -hmm. not just sort of you know doing the image critique thing and taking the assumptions of bourgeois economists or whatever but like if you there is a theory of value that you could derive from some of those comments in capital that um, I'm not sold on. That I think that like some of the points that that Cohen makes on are are pretty sharp uh, about how that's um, like um, if what we're talking about, you know, like like because because okay, what if the I mean one like way like one very straightforward way of setting this up is um, is that. Uh, like a, a kind of like a kind of dumb barstool libertarian objection to the labor theory of value is oh what so like if you're like really slow and like bad at your job you know that the stuff that you you produce is like more valuable you know because because the you know because you put more labor into it and anybody who's read you know the opening pages of capital will be able to immediately say 
oh no, you idiot. Uh, you know, cause, cause what we're talking about is average socially necessary labor time. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. But then one point that Cohen makes there, I think is actually pretty telling is, well, if all, if we're talking about an average, then all then like there are a bunch of things like ways that Marx will talk about workers producing value, like over the course of a day of labor, that it's it's like once you like really start to drill down on that, like in what sense is what you're doing producing the average, right? I mean, if 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 the um, like like is that like if the value is defined th- you know through reference to average socially necessary labor time, right? You know, is the you know, in what sense are you producing value? What sense is the capitalist actually extracting value? Like some of this actually gets a lot easier to understand if you think that value is money, um, you know, because, because like you're, you're certainly, you know, you're certainly, um, you know, one, one thing you're certainly doing in the labor process, whatever else you're doing is, is, is producing like actual money, you know, profits, you know, for, for the, uh, for the capitalist. Uh, so, so I think there are, you know, I, I think some of those points to me do hit home. Um, but the reason I don't say like, oh, so I don't think the labor theory of value is true is kind of what you said earlier, that it seems like there's a pretty wide variety in um, things, both in terms of Marx interpretation and just like later Marx is just, you know, try to figure out what's true about the world. There is like a pretty wide variety of things that people seem to mean by the labor theory of value. And I'm not sure that like they're all false. I think some of them might be true. Some of them might be true and related in interesting ways, you know, to what Marx is saying in Capital. I'm not sure. But where I do definitely go along with Cohen, uh, and, and this is a controversial, you know, it's a very controversial point, is that I, I, I don't think that you particularly need to, um, you particularly need to, to think that uh, anything labor theory value-ish is true to make sense of a lot of the core claims about exploitation that Marx makes in Capital. I think a lot of that stuff is actually logically independent of uh, of those premises. You know, you could just run the argument, you know, you could just run the argument without them, you know, that like a lot of the analysis of how, you know, just like, um, you know, people who um, we, uh, see, uh, see Jordan in the chat since she's in the capital class, she'll recognize all of this, you know, there's a, you know, but it's like, I, I, one of my favorite uh, chapters of capital that gets, that, that gets very little love is chapter 23, where he's, he's got this nice uh, argument about how, you know, the variable capital fund, you know, the, the part of the capitalist profits out of which workers are paid is, you know, wherever the sort of initial money and it comes from the, uh, the, you know, it's like constantly refilled, through the efforts of workers. So it'd still be true that, you know, that the money that workers are being paid, you know, comes from what's, you know, what's, what's taken from them. There's this nice, I think it's in that same chapter. There's this nice thing about, you know, you imagine a relationship between like one Lord and one peasant. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, the one day the Lord says, good news, you're free. Uh, you're, you no longer have these feudal obligations to me. We have capitalism now, bad news. I owe this land. And uh, if you want to continue to make a living, you're going to have to, uh, you know, you're going to have to continue to, uh, to work for me for the, um, uh, you know, you're going to have to become a wage laborer. And it turns out that you're actually going to be working just as many hours and keep mm. it just as much of the product as you were under feudalism, right? A lot of the, you know, a lot of the arguments that he makes that, you know, rely on these feudalism capitalism analogies, it seems to be uh, the labor theory of value isn't doing much work in uh in grounding those right so uh and, and also i i will say just because like i've had enough conversations about this stuff over the years that i kind of know what people are going to say like it's um not you but you know people out there in the world uh despite the fact that i've known you for many years i actually don't always feel like i know what you're going to say about stuff <laughs> like this but uh that um, keep everybody on their feet there you uh... go uh, but like, you know, but like one thing people say is like, oh, no, 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 I can see what you're going to do. You're doing, you're, you're turning this like, uh, historic, you know, historical, sociological, you know, economic claim about exploitation. You're, you're turning this, you're exchanging this for like a moral claim. And like, I actually don't think that's quite right. I think that, I think that like, you know, if you sort of run a lot of these, you know, claims a lot in the way that Marx often presents them in Capital with these analogies to feudalism and all that, like uh, you're still making a his- 
historical and sociological claim. In fact, it's it's a it's a separate it's a separate one from uh, from the from the moral claim. Like it maybe suggests the moral claim, right? But but in the in the same way that the um, the original one does, right? In other words, uh, that like you know like exploitation in the broadest sense, not just capitalist exploitation, right? If if what you mean is something like um, the uh, the immediate producers in any given society, whether they're peasants or workers or what they what they are, um, being you know coerced by the class power of the ruling class into surrendering part of the product of their labor. And in Marx's analysis, what Marx is ultimately most interested in is surrendering hours of their labor, right? The kind of extraction he's ultimately most interested in is the extraction of surplus labor, you know, those, those hours of your life. Like, look, that's just a historical claim that this is a thing that happens. You know, we could have a moral argument later about whether it's a thing that should happen. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe you could like, you know, I mean, there's, there's obviously such a thing as justified coercion, you know, like, like, like maybe you think like, you know, I don't know, uh, maybe you think anything other than capitalism would just lead to economic collapse and misery. So there's like, ultimately exploitation is justified in a utilitarian way or something like that, right? Like that's a, that's an argument somebody could make. I certainly wouldn't make it, but like the point is just to, the point is just, you know, to separate the two, right? That this is not, you know, like, like whether on Cohen's analysis or one that like that sort of emphasizes value theory in a way that, you know, he's, he's eager to get away from either way. Right. I think this is a, this is a, a claim about how societies work and, you know, the, the moral argument is somewhat separate. I think that that's fair enough. And I think uh, Cohen actually does a decent job on that. One thing that I do think a lot about um, when we discuss uh, what Marx was up to here. It does seem like uh, Marx is also critiquing certain socialist notions of exploitation and what he's doing um, that were very simple, uh, particularly ones that like, you know, like Pradone, which gives you exactly. like, uh, if you just uh, got all your, you know, got all your value back by being, by some socialism of petty bourgeois proprietor something or other mutualist, uh, that that uh, basically his argument is that we'd all be super poor. Um, you know, that's yeah. implied if you read Capital. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, the way I would, you know, again, I, w- I want you to tell me if this is not how you would read it, but it's like, like I actually think Proudhon is a is a target in a lot of Capital, and I and I think that the um, and in a in a, like a very specific way, right? It's like that. Um, so. Uh, like Marx, you know, Marx and Proudhon have in common the fact that they think that workers are exploited under capitalism, but their analysis of kind of what that means uh, and uh, and how it works is is really different, right? Like, like yeah. I think, like what I take them to agree on is that exploitation is a feature of capitalism, and that that's a bad thing, right? You know that they that like I mean you know people will go to great lengths to deny this, but you know, there's a, there is, there is moral outrage, you know, just, just boiling off of the pages of, uh, of some chapters of capital. Uh, and, you know, and, and he, he certainly talks about it as if it's a very bad thing, as if this is part of the, you know, this has something to do with why, you know, capitalism is bad and socialism is desirable. Uh, but I think that he thinks that both how it works empirically and why that's a bad thing or different than, than Proudhon does, right? Because because I think ultimately, you know, Proudhon to probably brutally oversimplify, and also a lot of this is just kind of based on being taken for granted that, you know, Marx's characterizations are right and blah, 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 right? But like they have a, is, um, you know, kind of thinks that, you know, like the problem with capitalism is it doesn't really live up to a certain kind of ideal of how markets are supposed to work. And, um you know, Marx thinks, no, I mean, like a lot of the point of capital is to argue that uh, the market's the problem, right? That the, uh, that, uh, that this is, um, I mean, there's a reason why all of the, um, all of the, like, histo- like all of those blood curdling historical chapters about how capitalism actually came to be don't come until the end of the book. Because for Marx's critique of political economy, he wants to, he wants to grant for the sake of argument for most of the book is like, look, forget how this comes about, right? Forget how, you know, it's like just given some really basic facts about how markets work 
and the assumption that there are, are that the uh, the conditions of production are concentrated on on one end and uh, and that they're, you're going to have a large class of people who have no realistic choice except for to work for capitalists. Given those assumptions, here's how it's going to play out. You know, just just by virtue of these like really general claims about the you know money commodity money prime process and you know and all that stuff. Uh, and so it's it's not that like it's not that if the markets were okay the uh, the uh, you know it's it's not like you know, like, damn it, if only the markets worked the way they're supposed to work, we'd be okay. It's that, like, there is no way for the markets to work the way they're supposed to work that we'd be okay. The the market's the source of the problem. And, like, so I think uh, when you think specifically about exploitation, like, there's this stuff that, I don't know, I want to say, like, chapter six, where he's talking about, you know, like, there's this famous and I think widely misunderstood passage about, you know, when right, you know, when right and right disagree, you know, force decides and all of that stuff. Where I, I think that the um, you know the point uh, actually this is kind of a weird citation for me because uh, this is a guy who does not like me very much but uh, William Clare Roberts and his, uh, his 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 book Marx's Inferno has a good line about this where he's um, he's like look when Marx sort of makes derisive comments about justice like you know he's not somehow critiquing John Rawls you know, a century in advance, right? You know, he's he's uh, he's critiquing people like Pradat, right? Who think like what they mean by justice is actually a certain kind of ideal of like market fairness that, you know, that, that everybody's buying and selling at the value of products. Hmm. I mean, what it does seem to be like why he would focus on Smithian political economy is to like grant its initial fit features yeah. and then and then draw out the logic logic that i'm not even sure smith didn't see to be completely honest um uh, smith's smith's main targets uh were physiocrats on one end and like rentiers on another but uh, um it, it's it, for example when people talk about the tendency of the rate of profit to fall the explanation for it is different in smith but smith and uh, ricardo and Actually, I can't find anyone uh, of any significance before the 20th century who denies that's a thing. It's another one of those things that's all over the the time period. Um, all that aside, uh, to go back to Cohen for a minute, because yeah, yeah. <laughs> because because you, you mentioned the other controversy, and yeah, that definitely. other controversy actually launches two other schools of Marxism that people do not realize have a direct relationship to analytical Marxism, and that is political Marxism of Brenner, Milk, and Woods. Um, I don't know who else is really associated with it, but yeah. uh, Robert Brenner and of the Brenner debates. And then there is the uh, world systems people who also come out of, of this. Um, and then there's some weirdos who try to mix Althusserian structuralism with analytical Marxism, which is that's painful to me. I'm not even going to really go into it, but um, it, it is a thing. Um, so, and I point that out because people, you know, will talk about modern Marxism as if the there's the the weirdo analytics and there's the Hegelians, and one there's multiple kinds of Hegelians. Let's like. Uh, the, yeah, right. the traditional MLs are Hegelians. Right. Um, but also that a lot of schools of, of Marxian thinking that emerge in the 80s and 90s actually go back to that debate specifically over Karl Marx's defense of history in the transition transformation um, not the transformation problem. That's a different debate. We're not going to talk about that right now. Yeah, but the transition right. between um, yeah between modes of production problem. Yep. Yeah. So so in uh, the uh, uh, also I see uh, see Fred Spencer in the in the chat says, "Well, why isn't he talking about Proudhon?" I have a he does a little bit in footnotes, but it's fair enough. Those aren't his main, you know. It's uh, it's not his main targets. I I my claim would be that I think he he thinks what's wrong with all these people is largely the same, but maybe best left for a different stream. So, um, okay, Cohen transition, uh, Brenner. Uh, so my, you know, so okay, so the uh, the Orthodox claim, you know, the eighteen fifty nine preface claim. 
uh, and again, many other places in Marx, but I mean, that's where it's all kind of spelled out the most, you know, um, schematically is that uh, you have um, that modes of production ultimately fall because they become fetters on the further development of the forces of production. Mm -hmm. um, and so eventually there's this, this conflict and, and the, uh, and you end up getting, um, you know, you end up getting the, uh, the, you know, being resolved, you know, well, either by sort of tossing back the whole process of, you know, and, and taking the, you know, the forces of production back to an earlier stage of development or, or by, or by changing the, the mode of production. Um, and uh, so, so there are two questions that we kind of talked about earlier. What is like the sort of the past version, which the one everybody's focused on is feudalism to capitalism, which is fair enough, because that's kind of the, the canonical instance, right? I mean, like, if you're an orthodox Marxist, then, you know, presumably, you also think that the transition from primitive communism to it to... could be like gyrus banerjee and traced capitalism uh, in its commercial form all the way back to the to the the roman empire as banerjee now does but but in general no <laughs> that oh, wow, that's, that's that that's fun i i actually have i've often wondered why that's not a sort of a sort of piece of logical space that somebody has occupied so it's it's a, that's that's fun to know that somebody is uh, cause, cause like, you know, cause like people talk about like, you know, we like have those debates about, you know, when capitalism starts, they have wildly varied estimates. I always wonder, it's like, hey, why doesn't somebody just say the, the Roman Republic? I mean, it's a, you know, very commercial society and blah, blah, blah. So interested to know somebody said it. Um, Nobody has said it. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, the sort of, uh, the sort of normal, bur bur uh, normal boring version of all this would be to say that, um, you know, presumably, yes, also you get primitive communism to, you know, ancient slavery, ancient slavery to, to feudalism, and then feudalism to capitalism, although... Um, and then there's the Asiatic despotism debate, but we're not going to go into that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's, well, that's, that's like a, that's like a, a, a cul-de-sac, right? So that, that's not supposed to be a sort of enter into this in quite the same way, but, um, but... Yeah. So, um, so anyway, nobody, you know, I, I think the sort of fettering claim probably for, for, uh, for primitive communism to early class societies is actually maybe straightforward enough that you, you sort of, um, have, uh, like a level of production with that level of technology. That's really hard to do if you aren't like forcing people to do it. And it's, uh, and not like forcing like the dull compulsion of economic necessity, but like forcing them to, to do it like with swords mm -hmm. um so like that that one might be fair enough you know whether ancient slave societies and feudalism are even totally different modes of production I mean, that's it you know whatever lots of debates you could have about every piece of this but just to skip to the one that everybody cares about right feudalism to capitalism you know the breader claim as i understand it is that um okay cohen is defending in Karl marx's theory of history this this straightforward like fettering account where uh you know like the, the the changes of the forces are really ultimately driving you know the changes in the relations uh and and cohen has a lot of interesting things to say and i think a lot of plausible things to say about how you can kind of understand that claim conceptually right i think he's like very good on things like how to you know some of the worries that people might have about like okay is this some sort of you know spooky backward causation that like this is going to help the bones, you know, the forces of production develop more rapidly in the future. Therefore, this is happening now. How does that work? You know, um, the uh, and I think he he has interesting things to say about that. They're sort of largely derived from metaphors to evolutionary biology. Uh, you know, when you say that you know something selected for, you know, that's that's not backwards causation either. Or maybe something similar is going on. You know, anyway, I, I find all that reasonably plausible. And he'll he'll tell these sort of um, what I think of as kind of like fables of historical materialism, which are sort of stylized situations in which things could play out this way. And, you know, he'll use in that book sort of particular examples of, you know, that are sort of plucked from the transition to feudalism from capitalism that I think very plausibly work this way, like the the uh, the, the death of the guild system, you know, which which uh, would 
one of the things it did is uh, basically make factories impossible because it limited how many, you know, apprentices could be working under one master or whatever in ways that, you know, you can't really have a factory with, you know, 200 workers in it. And, you know, I think it's like very plausible that, that you know, the death of that, you know, is played out the way that Cohen says it does with um, the, uh, with um, the, uh, that, you know, because there's this obvious incentive to, uh, to either break those rules or, or end the rules that this, this plays a causal role in it happening. But nevertheless, like somebody like Brenner's going to be like, okay, but like, let's really look at the historical record. Is this the main thing that was going on in the transition from feudalism to capitalism? And he's going to say no. And there's this, and you know, Brenner, as I understand it, has this like very specific story about England, you know, as the, as the birthplace of capitalism and the, uh, and the way that, um, the way that, um, you know, that there's this, you know, sort of very contingent local story about, you know, the, the bubonic plague and the ways that that, you know, played out, you know, played out politically and, you know, and it's, it's a, ultimately it's going to be a relations first story. It's going to be a class struggle first story that it's, it's, it's not, you know, that the, the sort of what's going on with forces is the forces is not really the main event here, you know, that there's this like other stuff, you know, that they're like, that there's all this sort of weird contingent happenstance that provides these openings in class struggle. And that's really ultimately why um, the, uh, you know, if we had a big, you know, I don't know, maybe you are, but you know, if there was another big Brenner head here, maybe they could do better than that description. But like that, that's, that's kind of what I got out of that. Yeah. Brenner emphasizes the relations of productions and the bourgeois revolutions in particular. And um, it really, I mean, like I, I've read his merchant's book, uh, which is a monster. Yeah. Um, it, you know, I felt like that book never ended, um, yeah. which is not a bad thing. Uh, I think the simpler form of it is the Ellen Milken's Wood book, The Origins of Capitalism, a longer view. It's a little bit, it's not as precise, not as detailed, but it is a little bit yeah. easier to like grok. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to me because the other side of this debate that kind of also splits off is the world systems people. And they're really insistent that capitalism begins in the Italian city states. And then there's the Banerjee commercial capitalism people who are like, well, capitalism began in the Italian city states. But if we take capital as the dominant mode of commercial relations, we can trace it all the way back to the Roman Republic. And I'm like, well, okay. Like, so, and, and, you know, to me, what that tells me is like, they're not agreeing on what capitalism is. Whereas the, the difference between Brenner and Cohen is a lot more specific where you're debating over basically if it's a mode that's driving things or if it's the relations that's driving things, right? Like, like that's. Yeah. So, um, and, and I, I am, I guess a, a position that taps me on that on that specific debate and i remember steve paxton saying something similar is that um that really that like i i think there might be like i think there might be a way in which both could be sort of right in other words that it, it could be that um you know it could plausibly be that uh, if the question we're asking is kind of how did capitalism get its first foothold in the world then the Bretter story might be, you know, correct about that. Uh, but if the question we're asking is what's the sort of main explanation for how capitalism becomes by far the globally dominant mode of production, then uh, ultimately there, there could be a more forces driven explanation of that, right. That the, uh, that like there's a, um, that ultimately like, okay, look, lots of things could get their first foothold into the world and then go nowhere. Uh, like, you know, I mean, we had, you know, I mean, we had a good, uh, Jesus, uh, you know, 70, uh, uh, you know, 74 years, right. 1917 to 1991 of, uh, however you think about that system, uh, existing, having a foothold in the world, you know, and, um, and, and not, you know, sort of spread into become the the globally dominant you know mode of mode of production, and it it does seem at least somewhat plausible that the the um, you know like in that example, right, the the failure of the you know Soviet 
model of socialism, if you do indeed think of it as a form of socialism or the Soviet, whatever it was, if you think about it as something else, uh, that they that that's failure to, you know, like that that had something to do with its failure to deliver material prosperity and that the um, and that the uh, runaway success of capitalism via all sorts of causal chains that all originated this place, right? Uh, does does flow through many tributaries from its ability to develop the forces of production wildly beyond what was possible from previous systems. Yeah. I mean, I will say if the exegesis on the Brenner debate is based on what Mark said, um, Jor- Jordan Dubin is reminding me uh, that in Capital Volume 1, Mark does have a footnote where he talks about the beginnings of capitalist relations in the Italian city-states because they're the first to abolish serfdom and develop something like bourgeois relations. Uh, um, but that's actually not what pe- a lot of the people in the world systems theory side is the reason why they believe it's in the Italian city-states. It has to do with mercantile trade with the Byzantine Empire. Um, and so, like, the... the it, with a lot of these questions, there's two different questions. Or actually, yeah. there's three questions. Um, one, do we think that uh, what is what Marx thought uh, Two, what is what we think is most likely to be true? Right, and three, right. do we think that what Marx thought is what likely to yeah, be yeah, true? Yeah, yeah. Given, yeah. you know, like you, it, those are all like if you answer one, if you answer the first one and then you answer the second one, then you normally have an answer to the third one, but I'm actually not always sure in some of the modern re, like recapitulations of what people say Marx thought, if that's the case. One of the things that I will will say that's frustrating about contemporary secondary sources, and people always ask me, like, where should I start with Marx? And I'm like, you should start with the text itself, and then maybe what he read, um, if that's what you really want to know, like what Marx thinks. Because almost everybody I read on this has an interpretive gloss that is specific to them. Yeah. Um, and, and some of them, dr- like, very pretty dramatically from what Marx says. Uh, yeah. I, th- there is one question I think that's pretty good that was asked that I, I maybe a way to kind yeah. of wrap this conversation up. Yeah. Um, what are the political implications of, of uh, Cohen's... Um, version of Marxian history, like like yeah, I saw that. Uh, I, I think, and, and by the way, I, I I do want to just say about what you what you just said. I think that mm-hmm. that's um, I think that's absolutely right, and it actually sort of ties the end of the conversation back to the beginning because, like, one of the things that I've always found most appealing about Cohen is that he's so good at separating those questions, right? Like that the uh, that um, that he's you know he's somebody who you know. To varying extents, depending on what Cohen book you're thinking of and what argument he's making, what subject and all that stuff. But it's like he's somebody who's like clearly coming from a place of thinking that like Marx got like most important stuff right, or at least that's his like kind of starting assumption, right? That the uh, that like the that that Marx um, that that Marx is you know probably right about most of this, and so like that's his that's certainly the bias that he's uh, he's working from, but. You know he's he's such a good and careful philosopher that he's he's like always really good and like he never treats Marx says X as if it were an argument for X. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know he's he's always very careful about separating out those questions and and you know I would say you know my own editorial comment like admirably ruthlessly honest about the cases where he thinks okay on second look actually never mind that part right mark says x but actually why uh so yeah i i what are the political implications well i think certainly um in terms of of what we've been talking about about fettering uh mm-hmm. i think there are maybe a couple um so like one reason why i think this is you know like not just a sort of uh you know i don't know like a kind of form of academic masturbation for Marx nerds, but like that actually there is uh, there, there is maybe something at stake in this in this argument is that I hope thinking about um, thinking about the federate issue should uh, should help us think harder about what socialism could or should be like about what we uh, you know what we kind of kind of hope to, to happen as as a result, because like, um, 
you know, like one thing, you know, and, and actually, so, so let me, I'm just trying, cause there are like three things here and I'm just trying to figure out how to arrange them, but it's like one, you know, so one, one real obvious point just to start with is that a, a point that, uh, Mark, that Cohen makes in one of the, uh, the extra chapters at the end of the second edition of Karl Marx's theory of history, which he, uh, he attributes, uh, he attributes in a footnote to his student, to my friend, Steve Paxton is that, um, or at least he says that Steve, you know, gave him a bunch of materials to, that he was like using the chapter or whatever, um, is that actually in a weird way, uh, the, um, fall of the Soviet Union, right, generally seen as a refutation of, uh, of Marxism, uh, is actually a vindication of, of, a, of, a, of one of the core claims of the Marxist theory of, of history, you know, that the, um, because, you know, I mean, it's cold comfort, obviously, you know, Marxists would prefer to have a, a politically desirable and, you know, economically viable uh, form of socialism flourish in the Soviet Union rather than be proven right, you know, if we had to pick. And I'm sure if that had happened, nobody would notice the disconnect. But uh, but it's um, but the idea, I mean, if you think anything like this forces first idea of historical materialism is true, then the idea that you could have a flourishing socialism in one country where that one country was a semi feudal backwater when the transition started is just like nonsense. Like that doesn't you know that doesn't make any sense given that given that assumption. Um, so, you know, it's a very uh, civilizationally unfortunate vindication, you know, because because that because I, I actually, um, you know, I'm an anti stalin I'm, I'm like kind of in a weird position of being like an anti stalinist who also thinks that the fall of the Soviet Union was a world historical tragedy. Well, but, I mean, that's that is a <laughs> to me, that's like kind of the only <laughs> like like responsible position but i know that's increasingly unpopular yeah. like uh yeah yeah although i i think i'm not gonna pick on your background i'm not sure no. most cliffites actually do necessarily oh no no most cliffites i i think would would disagree with that right they right have, it yeah. wasn't a tragedy the nfl yeah yeah exactly right i don't think they think that i don't think they think it's tragedy i think it's tragedy uh <laughs> i mean like 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 i think like it's uh i mean look i mean <laughs> Right now in 2023, if the world ends, uh, that's going to be yet more fallout from the fall of the Soviet Union. So right there, right, you know. But like, I think it's also, you know, I think it, I think it's, um, I think the more you read about what actually happened in the 90s, I mean, like, like we we use this, we throw around this word collapse of the Soviet Union, right? Collapse doesn't just mean dissolution. Collapse means collapse, like civilizational collapse, like dystopian science fiction novel collapse you know like like, like that, that like 40 percent of the men died and like no one even paid attention kind yeah, of collapse yeah like exactly it, it was it was not a good thing uh you know whether it was avoidable and what it would have taken to avoid it is a fascinating question we could talk about another time but yeah that's a that's it's it's a it's a bad thing uh but um but in any case yeah i think um i think that the so 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 thinking about that right that's like one interesting way that that there's like a sort of political upshot uh, to uh, to this uh, to this stuff because if you you know because like whether you know like I mean that is a at least historically important uh, debate you know the socialism of one country debate in the Soviet Union in the twenties uh, that I think if if uh, if anything like Cohen's understanding of the Marxist theory of history is true you gotta you gotta be on Team Trotsky on that one uh, and then uh, so that's one interesting upshot. Another interesting upshot uh, that I kind of alluded to was about, um, you know, degrowth, uh, which, um, you know, I, I think I want to be a little bit careful about this because there's a there's a sort of tendency that we often have on the left and not just on the left, but whatever the left is what I care about to um, just sort of um, use labels for ideas in a way that obscure the ideas that are being labeled. Right. You know, like, mm -hmm. like we have very intense attachments or, or dislikes to that become associated with the label. And like, we sort of often get, you know, um, you know, we talk past each other. We, you know, we're, we're not clear about what we mean, whatever, but it's like certainly at least one thing that some people mean by degrowth. Like if you look at this book, uh, half earth socialism, you know, as a, is a sort of recent extreme example where, um, people say, Oh, for the sake of, of environmental, um, 
you know, sustainability, what we're going to need to do is, and they've got this like vision of like a socialism that's like, um, I don't know, it's like everybody becomes a farmer again. And, mm -hmm. uh, and although there's also universal veganism, which would be very different from any agrarian society that's ever existed. And uh, also, um, and yeah, half earth, right. You know, we're, we're just sort of letting the, you know, letting the other half regrow and whatever. And that's, uh, you know, I mean, like, like that's a, there's a pretty stark difference between the idea that there's some sense in which um, the transition from capitalism to socialism unfetters the, the forces of production and, and that, right? I mean, those are, those are like really on opposite poles. Uh, and now, but then like, I guess the last thing is just like, okay, so um, let's just take it as, take it as read that like that's not our vision of a post capitalist future then what is and is there any important sense in which in which we could talk about an unfettering you know the forces of production uh i, I actually think is a pretty politically interesting question uh because you know so the uh, you know I, I we had, we talked about this earlier i don't know that i believe like um you know there are people who I know people who do, you know, some of my best friends, as they say, right, you know, but like, I don't know that I believe that, um, that it's plausible to think that in the most straightforward, obvious sense, the transition from capitalism to socialism would, you know, lead to, to, uh, you know, like much faster development or whatever the forces of production, right, you know, because it's like, you think about the rate of technological change, uh, if to the extent that that's what we're talking about, you know, the, the you know, introduction to widespread use of new techniques, you know, et cetera. It's like I don't know. Maybe I have a limited imagination, uh, but uh, but I have a hard time with that. And I I even think there are some reasons to think that you know it might be um, you know it might be the other way around, not to a crazy half earth socialism kind of point, but to you know to a point you know that that you could you could actually have you know somewhat less fast uh, development under you know kind of. Uh, you know, kind of for the equivalent of the same reasons why it would have taken a lot longer to build the pyramids with the same level of technology and free labor, you know, that, um, that like, if you, if, if, if producers have, you know, greater degree of autonomy and, you know, control over their lives and all that stuff, it's just, you know, like there's some loss of efficiency there that might be okay, you know? Uh, so, so what is, where does that kind of leave us, right? About what, like what sense in which that might be true, and, you know, there's an interesting suggestion at one, and I think at the end of the last chapter of the original edition of Karl Marx's Theory of History, that the, um, that, um, well, really the sort of motivation reforces a production is less that it's going to, that the transition from socialism is going to supercharge future development than just that, um, you know, there's this balance of you know work and study and free time and everything that that you know can be enabled uh by uh, that can be enabled by the transition to socialism and so maybe one way of thinking about that is it's like um maybe the ultimate question is not like purely what's going on with the forces of production but like is the you know what we're ultimately interested in is like the development of the forces of production to um uh, in the sense of of the sort of de of um, their development in directions that meet the need of some relevant group of of the population, I don't I don't know. That's a that's a half formed thought, you know. But I think that the I think trying to figure out what this means, I actually do think is not unrelated to to thinking harder about socialist political goals. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of. One of the things I find interesting about Cohen is like a lot of the stuff is still open in him. I mean, he, he was, someone asked, was he a labor party guy? I believe he was. He was, um, uh, he was associated with the left of the labor party. Yeah. I think he became more and more frustrated with it towards the end of his life because that was, you know, the Blairite period and, and all that. Um, I also think uh, he became, he he became more interested in moral arguments for socialism, which is, it, it, although I don't think the the Karl Marx, uh, uh, you know, Karl Marx theory of history of defense is actually that at all. 
Um, and to defend him on that, I think it is absolutely crucial. And I think of the, you know, we, we mentioned the other people, the other, the other people associated with him, with the exception of Eric Owen Wright, who is harder to pin down. One of the reasons why they don't stand, uh, like you don't, people don't read Elster and Romer that much today anymore. Uh, the Perzrowski is, is often read weirdly by ultra leftists. Uh, because of his use of game theory, but the the kind of like use of neoclassical economics and market equilibrium dynamics, uh, interestingly, fell out of favor as soon as these guys started getting old, even in more conventional economics. <laughs> so, uh, I think that's that's kind of interesting. Um, I, I do think it it is. Uh, I, I guess maybe just just on that point about the moral philosophy, as you say, like there's very little of that, and basically almost none in Karl Marx's theory of history, or you know, um, like sentences, you know, maybe you know of 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 it, but like maybe not even that, you know, really, like it's uh, uh, just by implication. But the um, but the three books you mentioned at the outset, right? Karl Marx's theory of history, why not socialism, and if you're an egalitarian, why are you so rich? um the you know like Karl Marx's theory of history is the way I would think about it at least is almost entirely taking place on the fact side of the fact value divide right he's 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 not he's not interested should questions he's interested how does history well how does Marx think history works and also how does it work and he thinks those are mostly the same you know answer um and then um uh, and then why not socialism as was said is like entirely you know, on the value side, it's, it's entirely, it's a, it's a, you know, book of advocacy of socialist values. Right. And then, um, uh, if you're an egalitarian, why are you so rich? He's uh, in the middle. It depends right on the middle. lecture. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's like, uh, cause, and, and some of it is like a really interesting transition, like, um, even though it's, you know, I don't know. I don't know if the actual order of the writing supports this or whatever, but it's like, you know, it's like a really interesting uh, place where those two, those two threads of what he's saying meet up to some extent, you know, because, um, you know, you, one of the, uh, you know, like one of the objections you could make to sort of bothering with moral philosophy as much as Lake Cohen does uh, is like, yeah, who cares? Right. I mean, this is not like if, if, I mean, just kind of crassly, I mean, you know, even, you know, even if you think, yeah, like there's just one possible, there's one possible direction of historical progress and you either go, go along that track or you're thrown back to something earlier, you know, socialism or barbarism. Um, even if you think that, I mean, technically the value question is still separate because you could just be a barbarism fan, you know, but. Yeah, uh, there are, there are people who, who, uh, who would favor barbarism or someone sometimes like me who's like, well, maybe you need socialism and barbarism what? Poor why Kendall. not both yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh exactly yeah so um but like what are the points that you know but then like uh if you sort of abandon that socialism or barbarism discussion uh you know uh dichotomy to some extent or at least complicate it right and you think like well um then uh, there are different, you know, there's like a much wider variety of things that might happen in the future that those, those normative questions start feeling a little bit more pressing again. And part of what Cohen is doing in the early chapters, if you're an egalitarian, why are you so rich? Is he's, uh, you know, he's questioning uh, that assumption, right? That the, uh, like, like, and like really specifically, he's tracing what he calls this, uh, the, um, you know, obstetric uh, metaphor in Marxism through like uh, earlier German philosophers before Marx, you know, ultimately, you know, I think it's a Hegelian thing uh, that, you know, this idea that the new society is, 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 you know, already, you know, gestated in the, the womb of the old one. And, you know, the only question is whether it's going to, you know, whether you're going to um, aid in a smooth delivery or not. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and he, clearly you know his discussion of that i mean right he clearly seems to have his his doubts right and, and so that like you know if thinking about whether that's entirely true is like an interesting way of connecting those two subjects yeah i think that's a that's a that's an interesting uh 
uh, thing to think about. Um, yeah, and I, I also like your your framing. I have to admit, I, I, when people mention the growth degrowth debates, I'm always like, but what if we just mean something completely different from either of those things? <laughs> like, like, like uh, you do have to like. There is a certain sense. And you could, there are a lot of people who rely on late Marx to, right. and some of the caveats in late Marx to say, oh, well, Marx doesn't really believe this. He thinks, I always push back on that because even his argument with Vera Sulek when he argues about the Russian communes being able yeah. to jump over, he, he actually says if they, if they are able to do it, it is actually still only because capitalism has existed in Europe and these technologies would be available to them. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's like he's still, I mean, it's, uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, Marx is, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like yeah. Marx is, still, uh, you know, is, is uh, yeah, it, it could like, once you hook up the Russian communes to the industrial base of, of Western Europe, you know, then, you know, which is more or less the Lenin Trotsky gambit from 2017 in a different way, right? It's not the, it's not the peasant communes anymore, but I mean, it's the, you know, it's the same idea that you can make up for the lack of industrial development in Russia, you know, if the revolution spreads to the West. Right. I mean, and it's definitely by the time you have the Sino Soviet split, there's literally no way you can imagine them getting out of the cul de sac that they're in. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, uh, not to bring it to somebody who's definitely not an analytical Marxist, but someone who I actually find quite useful um, is yeah. Hillel Tickton's like study mm -hmm. of the Soviet economy, where like, it doesn't seem like there's a coherent mode of production in that society. <laughs> like, it just doesn't seem to be there. Oh, okay. so, so here's like a really, because I've, I've wondered about this for a while, but you can explain this to me, because this is something I've, um, like, here's like a sort of simple-minded objection to the Hillel Tickton stuff. It says, okay, there's no mode of production in the Soviet Union. It's like, well, hold on, what do you mean? I mean, stuff is getting produced, right? It's, uh, it's getting produced in a way, and we can even talk about a way in terms of social relations, because there are people with, you know, various roles there are platters there i think are, you know, what, what tickton is arguing um is that you have a clear that the way the soviet union acts on the world stage and the way it does planning and the way it actually implements the planning economy those three things are not compatible with each other okay. what like by the time you get to the 1970s the soviet union is borrowing and trading in money like a capitalist that's undeniable yeah. um uh, it, uh, as a as a nation state but then you have the fact that like unlike say china where like state socialism like state capitalism is more clearly a, an analog right like because the uh, state literally owns capitalist businesses that have millionaires right. who are who who benefit from the shares even though the state technically has controlling shares or employees have controlling shares or whatever and there's a bunch of different uh, arrangements in china um none of that was true in the soviet union like the, the the state was the brokerage firms had a different exchange rate for trade with themselves than they did on the open market with with the rest of the world and uh, and differently from the way stuff is traded between individuals now i you could still argue that that's some form of capitalism you could argue right. that that's from some form of degenerated worker state i think right. my big deviation as someone who was experienced in trotskyism was like i don't really see the difference when you're saying state capitalism versus degenerated worker state because the uh, because what you're talking about one is a mode of government and who started it and the other is what it's doing on the world market and those could be like those could be like both of those things could technically be true. Um, yeah, how you could even I like go back and I go uh -huh. back and forth on this. I don't know. I mean, I, I also think, don't know that it matters after night. No, yeah, right. It's, it's like, also it's also become sort of almost completely irrelevant, right? I mean, the the, the part of it that's still relevant is maybe like what you think of these uh, holdout countries that are you know, whatever they have, it's also not really, you know, what the Soviet Union had back then, you know, so, so maybe it is just completely irrelevant. It's like, it's, it's like, um, you know, um, it's, it's, it's just, a at this point, you know, it's already like arguing about, you know, what to call the, you know, mode of production, ancient Rome or whatever. But, um, but yeah, since this is as a, as a weird biographical artifact of both of our lives, something we spent time thinking about, uh, the, um, yeah, I don't. I don't know. I've, I've never. I I've used never... to even think that state capitalism was necessary. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, uh, so like, okay. uh, which is which is which is an even more unpopular position to say that like, oh no, like 
like the monopoly capital which develops from capitalist competition would lead like it's a hilferding thesis like will lead to state capitalism and that sucks but it's also but that's how you might get socialism <laughs> like yeah. Yeah. um <laughs> Which is interesting, which, I mean, at least I think that's sort of more coherent than the way a lot of Marxists talk about monopoly capitalism, because there's this sort of, um, there's this sort of weird way which people want to claim that uh, capitalism now is this, is this different stage, it's monopoly capitalism, but it's like, they still want to say, you know, like, what's weird is they said that about Fordism too. Like yeah, Fordism and neoliberalism are both monopoly capitalism. I'm like, in the sense that there's a huge a, a state involvement in the economy, sure. But in the sense, like, they work so differently in other ways that saying that they're one-to-one -one exactly the same thing is weird. Um, yeah. Yeah, right. Like, nothing happened in that, yeah. in that transition. Yeah. No, that's weird. And it's also just weird no matter which one or both you're talking about, you know, to just say like, well, uh, actually capitalism isn't competitive en anymore. Right. Cause it's this new thing. It's monopoly capitalism. And then also say that Marx's analysis of how capitalism works, which, you know, still kind of all holds, but it's like that, that analysis, like competitive pressure plays a huge role in that, in that analysis. So it's, um, I, I don't know. I, I don't. I, I sort it of gets you I, into weird places, like my friend Stephen Hamill, who who really believes that capitalism is already dead. Yeah. Like, so it's it's uh. Yeah, or or to go back to some of the figures you mentioned earlier that we we have something called political capitalism, which is, um, you know, I, in my more uncharitable moments, just kind of sounds like a way of saying that the uh, that like what like. Uh, you know, corruption exists, you know, like that, like it's, um, you know, bad people be bad. <laughs> bad people be bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, th th there are some times where I'm, I, I am glomming onto like decadence arguments. Cause I'm like, why does our bourgeoisie seem to suck even by bourgeoisie standards? <laughs> but like, you know, th there was a heroic bourgeoisie at some time. I know we forget that they existed, but they really did. Yeah. Like, uh... Uh, but you know, also Marxists don't talk about the heroic bourgeoisie anymore. It makes people uncomfortable. Um, well, so I also think some of that's just cause like everybody, um, I don't know. I have a, uh, maybe this is going to be, uh, going to go peak old man. You have to shut it down. But I, also I think some of that is just what the internet does to everybody's brains. Cause like the, <laughs> every, um, it's like everything has to be, I mean, it's funny. We we're talking about Gia Cohen. It's like, look, like some of Cohen's work on moral philosophy, I'd actually defend. I have a critique of part of it, right? You know, but like some of it, I I actually find pretty insightful. But it's like my, uh, but it's like part of what it seems to be that the internet in the form that it exists right now, what it's done to everybody's brains on the left, is it's like this sort of thing where you have to like, you know, you have to be forming a moral judgment about everything every five seconds, and yeah, uh, yeah. and you can kind of only process anything that anybody ever says through the frame of like what moral judgment that's going to cause you to make in the next five seconds. And it's like, you know, I don't know. I, I, I yeah, find that unhelpful. Me too. And one of the things I like to contextualize is like a lot of the monopoly capital arguments, like Sweezy, Paul Baran, those sort of people. Um, uh, I actually thought made, they, they were things that made sense in the sixties and seventies to believe because there hadn't, because the, the Soviets were predicting a major depression after world war ii that never happened right right it did seem like you know for the social compact like at least pushed off for half a generation the normal capitalist cycle but it came back uh, like so uh, yeah <laughs> yeah which right yeah i mean and i think a lot of people also don't know that monopoly capital may or may not imply depending on which version of it that the mcm circuit no longer is true um and for those yeah. of you who don't know what that is you got to go read capital volume one through through three to grok honestly like and most of that sadly is in the i don't know how you feel about the ver the volumes of capital i love them all but the hardest one to read is actually the shortest one and that's capital volume two because it seems like it's the most unfinished <laughs> like um but yeah thank you so much ben do you have anything to say in closing Say, volume two is the, 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 the
look, you can tell Volume One is there's so much good stuff in three, but it's like you can tell that Volume One is the only one he actually uh, had sculpted as something ready for publication. Right, and the other ones are like you know, uh, telling Eagles to you know do what he could with it, you know, yeah. but because like just as a sort of uh, just as a literary work, right? I mean, like it's it's uh, it's just really good because he's, he's just so elegant about you know. Uh, especially after you pass the first few chapters, you know, even the first few chapters, like, you know, sort of mixing the, the, uh, the slog analysis, you know, with, with these, with these, uh, these, like, striking, you know, flourishes, you know, and it, it's just, uh, if you keep reading, you just have to understand you're reading something new, you're reading a different kind of thing. But, uh, I don't know, uh, I think, um, you know, I think, uh, I've, um, you know, if you want to see, uh, you know, so some of the books that you mentioned, uh, I've, I've written stuff about for, for Jackman, uh, in, uh, in Karl Marx's Third History. I wrote a uh, long piece called uh, Do You Understand Marx's Energy and Bellin? And, and, uh, and Why Not Socialism? It's much more what's called something like G.A. Bellin, his reflection on the socialists. And then if you, if you want the, the full take on the uh, on, on what Cohen gets right, what he gets wrong, and if you're an egalitarian, how come you're so rich? Uh, got to read the got to read the McManus and Hamilton collection when it comes up. All right. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm going to put some links in the show notes. I think I already have one or two uh, of your articles on G.A. Cohen for Jacobin. Uh, thank you so much, people. Please check out. Give them an argument. Um, and have a great day.